The musket ball was fired from 50 feet. It pierced the admiral's gold epaulette, shattered his shoulder, severed his spine, and flooded his lungs with blood. Horatio Nelson had always wanted to die a hero. And on the great column in Trafalgar Square, his death in the hour of victory is duly immortalized in bronze and stone. It is all too easy to forget that this was also a man of flesh and blood. For the Nelson, who was a brave, brilliant and humane war leader, could also be vain, ruthless, impetuous and all too human. It was the summer of 1805. Years of blockade duty had trained the men and ships of the Royal Navy, constantly at sea, to a pitch of readiness, rarely equaled in war. Rigs, sloops, schooners and frigates prowled the enemy shoreline, poking their noses into every harbor on the French coast. Their main focus was the port of Boulogne, here, the French had assembled a fleet of landing craft and were training a great army to invade England. And commanding the operation was that unrivaled master of war, Napoleon Bonaparte. One thing that stood between Napoleon and Britain was the Channel, and if he couldn't control the Channel, he couldn't get his armies across. He knew that. He knew he had to sweep aside British naval power. He had to come up with a scheme that would enable him to have that stretch of water free of British ships so that he could get his troops across. They just need a little gap in Britain's defences and they expect that they will be over the English Channel and they will be invading Britain. Napoleon thought, if I can be master of the Channel for three days, I will be master of the world. That's how crucial it was. The British public believed that one man could save them from Napoleon, Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson. But Nelson himself was not so sure. For two years now, he'd sought to bring the French fleet to battle without success. As always, when things went wrong, Nelson became ill with worry. Your poor dear Nelson is my dearest Emma. Very, very unwell. After two years hard fag, it has been mortifying not being able to get at the enemy. He must have been absolutely worried, sick, that, that the fleet would, the French fleet would get into the Channel and enable Napoleon to invade England. The constant anxiety I have experienced has shook my weak frame, and my rings will hardly keep upon my fingers. I think he realised that the whole, you know, future of uh, sea power in this country rested on his shoulders. But he was very weary. He'd been suffering from all sorts of aches and pains. He'd been at sea for an awful long time, literally been on board Victory just ten days under two years without putting a foot on dry land. I really believe that my shattered carcass is in the worst plight of the whole fleet violent pain in my side and night sweats, heat in the evening, quite flushed. And so not unsurprisingly, he was beginning to write letters home saying, I really need some leave, I really need a rest. His hair was quite white. He'd lost his teeth, he'd lost his top teeth. And as to his state of mind, well, he was 
he was pretty sure of himself as Nelson, but all the, all the same, he had the feeling that he might not have done the right thing. It looked to some as though Nelson were guilty of an error of judgment. He'd allowed the French Admiral Villeneuve to escape from the Mediterranean and link up with Spanish warships. With Nelson in hot pursuit, this powerful fleet sailed for the West Indies before doubling back across the Atlantic. And now, no one knew exactly where it was. On August the 19th, 1805, HMS Victory anchored at Portsmouth and Nelson came ashore with nothing to show for all his efforts. When Nelson arrives in England in 1805, he doesn't quite know what to expect. Um, he has not met and defeated the French fleet as he expected to do and as he knows the public expected him to do. So he must have felt a, a sense of, are they still going to love me? Are they still going to admire me? Before he'd even set foot on shore, Nelson had been ordered to send his sea journals to the Admiralty to explain why he'd failed to find the French. But to ordinary people on a rainy day in Portsmouth, he was still the hero, whose wounds made him one of the most instantly recognizable figures of his day. He once scribbled this note to an autograph seeker. Wounds received by Lord Nelson. His eye in Corsica, his belly off Cape St. Vincent, his arm at Tenerife, his head in Egypt. Tolerable for one war. Nelson was, in many ways, the very first pop hero. And so he comes ashore with those usual cheers that he's got used to over the years ringing in his ears. So he is reassured that the public are on his side. Now he has to find out whether the Admiralty is. In Whitehall, the 80-year-old First Lord of the Admiralty, Lord Barham, would examine Nelson's journals and analyse his decisions, orders and commands for the last two years. Barham is a, probably one of the greatest First Lord of the Admiralties that Britain has ever had. So he was a careful, chess-playing sort of Admiral who needed to weigh his options. And so he asked Nelson to send in his journals, the journals that every Admiral, every senior captain was required to keep. And he looked at these to see what Nelson's reasoning and thinking was. He's done this extraordinary trip to the West Indies, but was it the right thing to do or was it the wrong thing to do? And so he reserved his judgment. Had this maverick man made some bad mistakes here? Nelson had every reason to feel uneasy about Barham's scrutiny. From the very first moment that he'd come to public notice, doubts had been raised about his discipline and his judgment. The Battle of Cape St. Vincent was the moment when Nelson first came to public attention. It was 1797. Britain was at war with France and its ally Spain. Commodore Nelson was serving under Admiral Jervis when they encountered a fleet of Spanish warships. As the Spanish Admiral maneuvered to meet the British attack, a gap opened up between the vanguard and rear of his fleet. At the battle, right from the start, Jervis was aggressive and unorthodox. He drove his fleet in a hastily formed battle line between two groups of Spanish ships, separating them rather like an arrow going right to their heart. And then he turned his ships in order to deal with the main body of Spanish ships. But the wind shifted, the Spanish altered course, and the entire shape of the battle changed. At this point, Nelson, who was right in the rear of the line, realized that the Spanish could possibly get away. And so he simply 
attacked into the Spanish fleet and attacked them personally, head on, without referring to his commanding officer, from right angles, uh, which was an amazingly bold thing to do. He put his ship alongside a Spanish ship, the San Nicolas, an 80-gun ship, and headed a boarding party to capture her. He led his men through a stern window in the Spanish ship, captured it, and then found it had come up against another Spanish ship, a much bigger one, a first-rate Spanish ship of three decks, rather like the victory, in fact. Having forced the San Nicolas to surrender, Nelson stormed across its deck and boarded the formidable San Josef. He then led his men over to that one and captured that one as well. And this became known as Nelson's Patent Bridge for boarding first rates. That was the exploit above all, that kind of image of a senior officer, sword in hand, charging across two Spanish decks that really caught the public imagination. Typically, Nelson had acted according to the spirit, not the letter of his orders. And though Admiral Jervis privately approved, the official dispatch ignored this exploit. It didn't appear in the public dispatch. It wasn't mentioned by the Admiral. The person who made sure that it was mentioned and therefore known about was Nelson. The day after the battle, he carefully wrote out an account of the battle, including his boarding one Spanish first rate over another. He carefully had this signed by several of his own captains, and then he sent it to a friend in London, an old friend of his, a Navy captain, and said that he wouldn't mind at all if this appeared in the newspapers. And it did appear in the Sun and it did appear in the Times. Discover the past with exclusive history documentaries from History Hit and uncover the secrets of some of the most famous people and events in history. History Hit gives you access to a growing range of documentaries presented by and featuring historians at the forefront of research and debate. Whether you are looking to find out more about charismatic leaders like Cleopatra or to discover the story behind the Industrial Revolution, History Hit will have something for you. We also aim to bring you the stories and legends that shaped our world through our award-winning podcast network. Sign up now for a free trial and Absolute History fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY at checkout. Ever since, Nelson's place in the public affection was secure. But as he took the coach from Portsmouth to his home in Merton, he knew that Barham would take a cooler view. So there's a mixture of feelings, a sense of perhaps unease about whether he's going to be carpeted uh, for having failed to catch the French fleet, but also a sense of excitement and anticipation at being reunited with those he loves. After two years at sea, Nelson was coming home. These were to be the last 25 days he would spend with the people and in the place he loved most. In 1801, he'd bought a house near Wimbledon, where he could make a home with his mistress, Emma Hamilton. He was very much Paradise Merton. If you read his letters, he can't wait to get back to dear, dear Merton, which he considers the prettiest place in all the world. He's going to find um, Emma, Lady Hamilton, his lover, and their daughter, illegitimate daughter, Horatia. Emma always greeted him with... Um, oh, God, is it possible? You know, it was the full performance. Nelson was so dependent on Emma's hyperbolic welcome. You know, sometimes she'd faint. But she gave him the full whack. Emma was certainly an incredibly beautiful woman. She was a woman capable of showing great affection. She, she came along at a time when Nelson needed her. She was almost a mother figure for, for, for Nelson as well. 
and again we come back to Nelson's early loss of his mother, his need for a certain kind of female affection. Nelson came from lower middle class stock from Norfolk. His father was the parson of Burnham Thorpe Church. They lived on a nice plot with 30 acres. There were eight children uh, in the house and they had uh, servants, but life wasn't easy. He was very unfortunate that his mother died when he was nine, which must have been very hard indeed. His father, I think, was um, a nice man, very concerned about his children, but probably not the best person to try and bring them up without a wife. The loss of Nelson's mother when he was so young had a terrible impact on him. It left him with a vulnerability and he was insecure for the rest of his life. And towards the end of his life, even as a successful, decorated hero, still felt the loss of his mother and the influence that she'd had on his early days. The thought of former days brings my mother to heart, which shows itself in my eyes. After Nelson's mother died, the rector had a problem. He had eight children, he couldn't manage all eight children, and he looked to members of his family to help him find them careers. He was always very keen on the sea. And Burnham thought this not very far from the sea. And it's said that he used to go up to Wells and see the ships and acquired a tremendous taste for the sea and the navy. When Nelson decided that he would like to go to sea as a career when he was 12, his father wrote to his brother-in-law, his wife's brother, Captain Morris Suckling, and said, would he take Horace, as they called him? And Captain Suckling wrote back and said, What has Horatio done that he wants to go and rough it at sea, but let him come, because the first time we go into action, a cannonball might take off his head and provide for him at once. When he went to sea, at the age of 12, his father took him to London, but there wasn't really the money for father to go on to Chatham, so he had to go off to Chatham on his own. He found himself all alone on the dock. Uncle hadn't arrived. Somebody took pity on him and, and took him to the ship. Very tough for a 12-year-old. As a successful hero and an admiral. He was to sit at a dinner, as the custom was, next to the youngest person on board, and this battered man with his arm pinned up and his blind eye was to find himself next to a very nervous midshipman and said, what age did you join the service? And the young boy nervously looked up and said, 12, my lord. And Nelson muttered, too young, much too young. Looking back, he realised later on what a wrench it was for him to have joined the service at that age. In the course of his naval career, Nelson would see action on more than 120 occasions. By the time he was 17, Nelson had sailed in three oceans and almost died from tropical fever in the West Indies and in India from malaria. Nelson was ill on his way back to England after a voyage. I suppose he must have been in his teens. And he suddenly had this vision that he saw a golden orb. A sudden glow of patriotism was kindled within me. Well then, I will be a hero. And confiding to Providence, I will brave every danger. <laughs> 
And it does seem that from then on, his mind was set on uh, trying to uh, win all the honours that he could. Nelson had become a full captain by the unusually young age of 21. By 28, he was in overall command of British naval forces in the West Indies. But his private life was less successful until he met Frances Nesbitt, the young widow of a Jamaican plantation owner and the mother of a five-year-old boy. Nelson appeared rather forbidding to most of the people who first met him till they found him playing under the drawing room table with Josiah Nesbitt, who was the five-year-old uh, son of, of Francis Nesbitt. And th this was what first brought them together and first showed people that Nelson could be a human being as well as a, an able commander. They married when he was 28. I don't think it was really a very great success from the beginning, probably not helped by the fact that when they came to England, they went straight down to live in Norfolk because he was on the beach, which meant he was on half pay because the war was over for the moment. She was very reluctant that he was going to risk his life in any way. But he was longing to get away and pursue his career at sea and was delighted in, uh, what was it, uh, 1792, when he had command of the Agamemnon and went to Chatham. At times, Nelson's pursuit of glory seemed almost suicidal. While serving with the Mediterranean fleet, he besieged the port of Calvi in Corsica. One of the essences of Nelson's leadership was he led from the front, always led from the front. He led from the front as a junior officer when it was expected, and he continued to lead from the front as an admiral when it was not. You could see the effects of that in his body, with his um, battered head and missing arm and so on. As Nelson attacked Calvi, a vigorous artillery duel was underway. He was ashore in Corsica, setting up guns to bombard the French position. <laughs> cannonball landed in a sandbag quite close to him. The gravel flew up, hit him in the side of the eye and damaged the, the ret probably the retina of the eye. Nelson never wore an eye patch. The, the eye was not unsightly. He had not lost his eye as such. He had lost a sight of his eye. Typically, he writes to his wife and he says... I don't think the vision's going to come back in that eye, but never mind, I've got another eye. But Nelson's lust for glory put many more lives than his own at risk. In 1797, he was sent to Tenerife to seize the town of Santa Cruz. Nelson planned quite carefully attack on Tenerife. He sent um, his, his captains ashore with landing parties, and that, that failed. Nelson then decided to launch a second attack two days later, which he led himself. That night, and without the element of surprise, Nelson ordered a frontal assault on the main fortress. He was leading a landing party, which was attempting to uh, capture a Spanish prize ship, and he was actually landing from the boat in the act of drawing his sword and a musket ball shattered his arm just above the elbow. An artery was severed, so blood poured everywhere, uh, which upset him and made him feel very faint. His stepson, Josiah Nesbitt, was there. He quickly applied a tourniquet to it and possibly saved his life. It was extremely difficult to row away from the shore, but they managed it. And when he got to the top of the ship, he went on board and he actually said, tell the surgeon to make ready because I know I've got to lose my arm. And in the cockpit of his ship, his arm was amputated without anaesthetic. They would have two men to hold Nelson down, 
He appears to have been given beforehand absolutely nothing in the way of painkiller, analgesic. There's only about five inches of arm left. And he used to call it his fin. Uh, I'm Lord Nelson, here's my fin. For the rest of his life, he remembered the pain as the cold knife cut into the flesh. And later on, he issued an order that surgeons were to warm the knife before amputating limbs. Nelson was completely traumatised by the wound and there was no mistaking the fact that his arm wasn't there, that he'd gone through a terribly painful operation, that had even been, also been involved in a very unsuccessful military operation. He managed to lose twice as many men as were, that had been killed at the entire Battle of St Vincent. And he was somewhat blamed for this. You have to say it's a disaster. In that sort of sense, it was characteristic of Nelson because wherever he went, large numbers of people got killed. Uh, in that sense, he was something of a serial killer in military terms. He wrote that he had launched the second attack and led the second attack because his pride had been hurt by the failure of the first attack. Well, there were those who said that his pride had cost the lives of a good many men. And all that contributed very much to his depression. He wrote to St Vincent with his left hand, and you can see pain and uncertainty in every letter of that letter. I am become a burden to my friends and useless to my country. You will excuse my scrawl, considering it is my first attempt. He wanted a frigate, as he said, to carry the remains of his carcass back to England. He wrote later, nobody will ever have any use for a left-handed admiral. He was quite convinced that his career was over. He began to recover from that once he got home. His Lady Nelson nursed him back to health. This is possibly the happiest period of their marriage, the, the period when they, they were closest together, really. He found out he was a popular hero, and this did very much to raise his spirits. And physically, his health began to improve as well. In 1798, Nelson's popularity increased further when a large expeditionary force, commanded by General Napoleon Bonaparte, slipped out of Toulon. A British fleet was hastily assembled with orders to seek and destroy. To the fury of more senior admirals, the command went to Nelson. But this time he was to show that he not only took risks, but could bring them off as well. Nelson took his fleet into the dangerous waters of the Mediterranean, but despite a frantic search, failed to prevent Napoleon reaching Egypt and landing his army there. When he did eventually catch up with the French fleet, it was anchored in the Bay of Aboukir, near the mouth of the Nile. Throughout his later life, Nelson was actually known as Nelson of the Nile. The Nile, tactically, is an example of Nelson's brilliance. It shows him, first of all, planning the battle in advance and communicating that to some of his captains. He had had them on board his ship for dinner parties and for briefings so that they knew in advance what to do, and communicating to them a sense that they could do things themselves without waiting for orders from him. And it was very unusual. Admirals did not in those days share their ideas in advance with their captains and that more than any other thing was what made Nelson special. As soon as lookouts spotted the French, Nelson ordered an immediate attack. It was an extraordinary decision because night was falling and the French were anchored in a strong defensive position. The Nile was a very risky battle for the British. The French thought that they were close up against the main shoals in the bay and that they therefore could not be attacked on the landward side. But as the British closed for battle, one of Nelson's captains spotted a weakness in the French defence. Captain Thomas Foley of the Goliath notices there's a big enough gap and deep enough water for him to sail between that ship and the shore. In other words, to go around that ship to attack it 
on the side that they're not expecting. And the captains that were there at the head of the British line made the decision without any orders from Nelson to go round inside the French line and so take it on both sides and crush it rather like a nutcracker. And that risk that they took, knowing that their admiral would support them, is one of the most fascinating aspects of the battle. With consummate seamanship, the first four British ships sailed round the landward side of the French line and quickly inflicted terrible damage. As Nelson came in, he decided to double the line to intensify the attack. Remember that the French were not duffers as fighters and seamen. One of their captains had both his legs taken off by a round shot, called for a bran tub, and had his torso placed in the bran tub as he bled to death, still giving his orders. The courage of that uh, deserved greater success than they actually had. As usual, Nelson was in the thick of the action when a chunk of metal struck his forehead struck him on the forehead and sliced a piece of flesh that fell down over his good eye and blinded him with the blood. And so much so that he thought he was killed. Nelson was still below when he heard that the French flagship was on fire. He was helped back on deck. And fire is in many ways the most terrifying thing to a seaman in those days because as well as burning, everybody knows that eventually the ship is going to blow up. The explosions were so huge uh, that they ripped the ship apart. Next morning, Nelson surveyed a scene of utter destruction. Victory is not a word strong enough for such a scene. Only two battleships and two frigates escaped. They were led by Pierre de Villeneuve the man destined to command the French at Trafalgar. The Nile was a victory of annihilation. It was the first time anybody had, had achieved that scale of victory in naval warfare. The Nile was the defining battle in his career that really established him as an immortal hero over and above his contemporaries. But Nelson's triumph was the prelude to the darkest episode of his life. And in the summer of 1805, as the First Lord of the Admiralty was weighing the highs and lows of Nelson's career, the events that followed the Nile must have made bleak reading. To mend his ships and heal his wound after the Battle of the Nile, Nelson sailed to Naples. He arrives in Naples, which is a voluptuous, beautiful city with stunning buildings. He is hailed as a hero uh, by the, the Neapolitans. This flotilla of boats came out to greet them with you know, bands playing Royal Britannia, etc. the king and queen of Naples, King Ferdinand, was in one boat and in another was the ambassador, Sir William Hamilton, and his very gorgeous and voluptuous wife, Lady Emma Hamilton. She was terribly thrilled to really meet the victor of the Nile and is supposed to have had a dress all bedecked with Nelson and all that sort of thing. Lady Hamilton was at that time probably the most beautiful woman in Naples. She had a, the face of an angel and, and the body of Venus, and, and that contrast made her extremely attractive to man. And she fell at his feet, you know, saying, Oh God, is it possible? He comes ashore as an emotionally mixed up man. 
and he's greeted with the motherly sexuality of Lady Hamilton. Uh, and I think he found it irresistible. Emma had a chequered past. The daughter of a blacksmith, she'd moved to London where she became an artist's model and a rich man's mistress. But her marriage to Sir William Hamilton, the British ambassador to Naples, gave her status and respect. And there is this wonderful, voluptuous woman, this gorgeous woman, who thinks he's absolutely wonderful, who swoons into his arm with excitement at meeting him. Who on earth would not have fallen? Nelson was not a well man. His head wound was causing pain and violent mood swings. He had these dreadful headaches as the result of the wound over his eye and probably fell into bed but had the good fortune to be nursed by Emma, which must have helped. And she was a brilliant nurse, and she nursed him with, I mean, ass's milk, shades of Mark Antony and Cleopatra. And so down in Naples, far away from, you know, the seat of command and, and the admiralty, they embarked on this sort of folly idea. It was not long before Nelson and Emma became lovers. Last night, I did nothing but dream of you. You came in and taking me in your embrace, whispered, I love nothing but you, my Nelson. I kissed you fervently, and we enjoyed the height of love. It's quite clear from the letters that Nelson wrote to Emma that sex with her was incredibly exciting. He refers to liberties which no other woman ever took with me. And I think that's one of the things that bound him to her, that, that they were obviously compatible lovers. And it made sense to be with her. It made sense of his life in the way that this often can. Emma was close to the king and queen of Naples. In politics, Nelson was always royalist and conservative. Thanks to Emma, he was drawn into the affairs of court. He's used to ordinary, humble English homes. The most, probably the grandest place he's visited is St. James's Palace, which doesn't compare in any way to the great palaces of Naples. There were huge parties arranged in his honor, unbelievable presentations. He was showered with gifts. And I think it wouldn't have been long before this would have had an effect with all the adulation he was being shown. It went to his head. There were the heady days in the rich setting of the Neapolitan court. And he was soon to write to St. Vincent, I'm writing opposite Lady Hamilton, therefore you will not be surprised at the glorious jumble of this letter. In a postscript, Nelson added these prophetic words. Naples is a dangerous place, and we must steer clear of it. Naples was to prove more dangerous than Nelson had imagined. Four months after he arrived, the monarchy was overthrown by a republican revolution, backed by the French. The king and queen fled to Nelson's ships in the Bay of Naples. On a night when Vesuvius erupted and there was a terrible storm at sea, Nelson helped the royal family to escape. The king begged Nelson to support a royalist counterattack. The queen hated Republicans. Her sister Marie Antoinette had lost her head just five years before in the French Revolution. She asked Emma to use her influence over Nelson. My dear lady, I recommend Lord Nelson to treat Naples as if it were an Irish town in rebellion. In my opinion, an example should be made of some of the leaders. By the time Nelson returned to Naples, the French had retreated, leaving the Republican rebels to face the consequences. <laughs> 
the rebels were entrenched in the three castles, two castles by the sea and one on top of the uh, hill of Sant'Elmo. And with these three castles, the rebels could dominate the harbour. But the rebels were surrounded on all sides, so they agreed to surrender on terms. The rebels signed the capitulation, but they were allowed certain privileges. And they would, would go out uh, of the castles with the honor of war. And uh, they would be unharmed. When Nelson heard of this, he was furious because these were rebels. They were not only rebels, but they were sort of Republican rebels. And they were not only even Republican rebels, but they were Republican rebels who had supported the French. It was a, it was a heavy indictment. And uh, he, he couldn't uh, stomach any sort of uh, accommodation with them. Nelson masked his true feelings and allowed the rebels to leave the safety of the forts and board transport ships. They went on board of the ships believing, firmly believing, convinced that they were going to sail to safety and they found themselves in a, in a prison. And immediately they got on board, they are penned in by the ships of Nelson's fleet. They don't go anywhere. They are kept in these ships for something like a month. The ships became prisons. And uh, every day, a Neapolitan uh, judge and, uh, and uh, policeman would go on board and select some of the worst uh, uh, chiefs of the rebels and bring them to the Piazza del Mercato, the market square, and they were brought to the gallows. A lot of people were executed, some in bizarre and horrendous ways. In one case, a dwarf was seen to sit on the shoulders of the person that was actually being hung while they were still alive. Lots of officers were to write home they'd seen very sickening sights, not only carried out on men, but on, on, on women, and some of them very young. The victims included the cream of Naples' intellectual and artistic life. They'd been received at court, and Emma Hamilton knew them personally. Lady Hamilton took some active part in these uh, tragic events. Some documents, uh, written, handwritten by Lady Hamilton, um, lists of uh, what she considered the worst rebels, indicated that she was not just watching passively. To annul a treaty is one thing, and that's bad enough. Then to rely on it to seduce people on board ships to, in order to hold them prisoner and to hand them over to the King of Naples and to the executioner, is a pretty bad show, and there were those who said that this was not quite the act of an English gentleman. The cruelties that were visited upon the leaders of the Republic were carried out by Neapolitans, not by Nelson. Nelson may have enabled that situation to come and is therefore must share some of the blame, but he did not actually personally uh, order or take part in the massacres. Whatever role he played in this bloody counter-revolution, Nelson's part in the trial of Admiral Caracciolo is beyond dispute. Admiral Francesco Caracciolo was a navy man. He was a real navy man. It was not uh, an operetta sort of thing. And he felt the king had betrayed Naples because he ran away from Naples much too quickly. Caracciolo was captured brought to Nelson, and Nelson insisted on him being tried straight away by court-martial of Neapolitan officers. Though the trial was a travesty, Nelson supported its grim verdict. Caracciolo was not allowed an advocate. Uh, he could have no witness to defense. He didn't ask to have his life saved. He knew probably there was nothing to do. He only asked to be shot and not hanged because he felt the accusal of better, that he was not a traitor, he should have a more honorable death. But this was refused to him. Nelson hanged the man the same afternoon at five o'clock. And moreover, he added an indignity to that. He let him hang from, from the yard arm until um, sunset, and then he had him hacked down so that he fell into the sea, so that he could not be given a decent Christian burial. <laughs> 
The incidents at Naples were among the most controversial incidents in Nelson's life, and they were controversial at the time. So much so that Robert Southey, the great poet laureate, who wrote a, a very fine biography of Nelson in 1813, actually, in his biography, called Nelson's behaviour a stain on the national honour. Nelson was not supposed to be spending all this time in Naples. He had disobeyed the orders of his superior officer, and finally he got a stern rebuke, which he couldn't ignore. You will recover far more quickly, because Nelson had been worried about his health, in England than inactive at a foreign court. However pleasing the respect and gratitude shown to you for your services may be. Nelson travelled back to England with Emma and her husband. Their celebrated menage a trois titillated the entire continent. Everywhere they went, Nelson was hailed as a hero. Court painters painted their portraits. In Vienna, Haydn accompanied Emma on the piano and dedicated this mass to Nelson. But in England, their reception would be far less respectful. In England, Nelson and Emma were a national joke. The Admiralty would not send him a ship, so he and the Hamiltons had to use the ferry just like anybody else. I think when he, when he first came back to England in 1800, I think his reputation did dip quite low. The press tended to joke about the whole thing. They said, they said that uh, Emma was the chief archaeological treasure which Sir William had discovered in his expedition to Naples, that kind of thing. Suddenly, you had the three of them going round together, cutting a completely ridiculous, um, you know, picture with him covered with stars and ribbons, and with and with Emma Hamilton, you know, huge, absolutely huge lady, who was, you know, obviously on his arm as his lover. There were lots of really quite uh, risque cartoons with lots of phallic symbols in them and so on, which made it quite clear that everybody knew exactly what was going on. In one cartoon, you see uh, Emma and Nelson together, and Emma's looking at him with admiration and him smoking his pipe. And underneath it says, Foe, the old man's pipe is always out, but yours burns bright with full vigour. The press um, began to show Lady Hamilton as putting on a great deal of weight. They didn't know she was carrying Nelson's child at the time, of course. I don't think Fanny liked the situation at all. She must have seen that there was something wrong as far as she was concerned. But uh, some time after that he made it known that he would go and live somewhere else. The Ménage à Trois ended in 1803 with the death of Sir William Hamilton. Before that the three had lived together in Merton Place, which Emma transformed into a shrine to her lover. Nelson's vanity and scandalous private life now led many powerful men to doubt his fitness to command. Nelson's friend, Lord Minter, said in many ways he's a great man, in others he's a complete baby. Nelson was incredibly vain, and whenever you saw him, he'd have every decoration he could possibly hang onto his, onto his uniform. More like a prince of the opera than the conqueror of the Nile, according to General Sir John Moore. And Admiral St. Vincent wrote, Poor man, devoured with vanity, weakness and folly, strung with ribbons and medals. There were serious doubts about his judgment, about his judgment in Naples, about his judgment in getting involved with Lady Hamilton as well. And certainly his old friend, St Vincent, now First Lord of the Admiralty, did not put him in sole command of the fleet that was sent to Copenhagen. And he said, Nelson will never be fit for an independent command. War, as ever, offered Nelson the chance to salvage his reputation. He was sent to fight the Danes at Copenhagen under the watchful eye of Admiral Sir Hyde Parker. Copenhagen was heavily defended, but Nelson was bold as ever. 
the British had to attack a strong line of ships protected by a massive fortress and perilous shoals. When three of the leading ships ran aground, Nelson's commanding admiral signaled him to withdraw. Nelson, ever the maverick, is said to have raised his telescope to his blind eye. I have a right to be blind sometimes. I really do not see the signal. Nelson's cannon battered the Danes into surrender, and he returned home with his public reputation restored. In the summer of 1805, Lord Barham, the new first sea lord, feared a French invasion was imminent. It was up to him to weigh up the qualities and defects of the Royal Navy's most controversial admiral. One of the things that must have influenced anybody working in the Admiralty, particularly a new First Lord, was that Nelson had an uneven reputation. Everybody knew he was a genius. He'd won the Battle of the Nile, he'd won the Battle of Copenhagen against great odds, he, he was a great fighting admiral. But what wasn't so well established was, was he a th careful thinker? Was he somebody who could weigh the strategic situation? The question facing Barham was stark. Could the fate of the nation be trusted to a maverick like Nelson? While the Admiralty was deciding his future, Nelson was enjoying his last 25 days at home in Merton. They led quite a, a social life during that time. They had people to dinner and all that sort of thing, people to stay. One of the visitors to Merton at this time was Thomas Baxter, the artist, who caught some beautiful little pictures of the house and of Nelson's daughter, Horatia. One of the joys of those 25 days for Nelson must have been the time that he spent with his daughter. Up until then, she had had to be kept out of the way. As long as Emma's husband, Sir William, was alive, Horatia had had to live with her nurse. But it, for the 25 days, she was with Nelson and Emma at Merton. He was very good with children. Uh, I think he enjoyed playing games with the little girl. He sent her a watch once, and he said, this is for you to wear on Sundays when you've been good. I mean, Nelson just shone the searchlight of his love on this baby. But rumours of war were never far away. One morning in September, news reached Nelson that the French fleet had been found in the Spanish port of Cadiz. Nelson hurried to London for an interview at the Admiralty with Lord Barham. By now, Lord Barham had studied Nelson's journals and concluded that when Nelson pursued the French across the Atlantic, it had not been an error of judgment, but a piece of strategic brilliance. Once he'd had Nelson up to the Admiralty, had met him, I think he became completely convinced that he was the admiral for the job. Barham began to realise they had somebody who was not just a great fighting admiral, but a great strategist as well. There was never at that time any doubt of the quality of Nelson as a fighting sea officer. He was, Nelson was a natural born predator. If you wanted a man to win a battle, Nelson. While in London, Nelson visited an undertaker who was putting the finishing touches to a coffin made from the timbers of the French flagship which exploded at the Battle of the Nile. Pedersen, you see, was not only an undertaker, he was also an upholsterer and a supplier of bedding. And he had supplied um, Emma, at Nelson's expense, um, with a large double feather bed on which I suppose the two, the two lay. Um, 
So there you are, the maker of feather beds and maker of coffins. And Nelson did go um, to this man, Pedersen, and say, well, get the coffin ready and put a brass plate on it. I may need it. Nelson and Emma part at the end of the 25 days in a very sad and resigned sort of way. Um, to begin with, they, they went through a rather odd quasi-married service in the local church. They went to Merton Church and there they took communion and having received communion they then exchanged rings. So there is a strong sense of Although they can't be husband and wife, they regard each other as husband and wife between themselves. Emma then becomes very upset and there's a very poignant description of her in tears at dinner because she knows that Nelson is going. And there, it's very hard to, to, to escape the idea that there was a strong sense of premonition. One of the last things he did was actually go up to Horatia's bedroom, kneel by her bed and pray for her um, before he stepped into the carriage that was taken to Portsmouth and the Victory and thus to Trafalgar. When Nelson left Merton for the last time, he did so with a heavy heart. Merton held all the things that he loved dear. Emma was there, Horatia. at half past ten, drove from dear, dear Merton to go and serve my king and country. May the great God whom I adore enable me to fulfill the expectations of my country. If it is his good providence to cut short my days upon earth, he will protect those so dear to me that I may leave behind. His will be done. Amen. 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 Nelson arrived in Portsmouth at dawn on the 14th of September. As he walked, he was surrounded by crowds. People were pushing for a sight of him. Uh, they were even holding up babies for him to bless. People were kneeling in the streets and calling out blessings on him as they went. Again, there was a strong sense of destiny. And as he got into the boat, they gave him three cheers and he waved his hat and turned to Hardy as he waved it and said, I had their hussars before, I have their hearts now. Nelson boarded the victory and the following day set sail to join the rest of the fleet off Cadiz. During his 25 days on shore, he'd already begun to formulate a daring, even reckless plan of attack. There was a certain way of, of fighting a battle at sea. It hadn't changed for a hundred years. You kept the ships in line, you lined up against the enemy and you fired broadsides until one or the other was so uh, damaged that they had to reel away. Very rarely ships were sunk. The problem with that was it was a completely defensive way of fighting a battle. If both sides did that, if both sides formed line of battle and stuck to it, nobody was ever going to get a decisive victory. When Nelson found the fleet assembled off Cadiz, he invited his captains to dinner. It was his 47th birthday. He talked to the captains and told them about the great plan that he had for fighting the battle. And he explained his tactical methods to him. He called it the Nelson touch, and he said the effect was electric. Nelson started describing how with a great fleet, there wouldn't be time to form formal lines of battle. So with the fleet formed in two lines, I shall go at them at once. And then he explained how the two lines would divide the French fleet into three segments and that he would then crush uh, two of those segments with superior gunfire, confuse the enemy, make them uh, so confused that they make mistakes. That's the essence of Trafalgar. When I came to explain to them the Nelson touch, it was like an electric shock. Some shed tears, all approved, 
It was new. It was singular. It was simple. At six o'clock on the morning of October the 19th, 1805, the watching frigates off Cadiz made the signal that every blockading British fleet had dreamed of for over two years. My dearest, beloved Emma, the signal has been made that the enemy's combined fleet is coming out of port. May the god of battles crown my endeavors with success. The 21st of October was very gentle. It was a, a quiet autumnal day with light winds. A very heavy swell was coming from the west, which indicated that there was a big storm brewing out in the Atlantic. And eventually, the whole combined French and Spanish fleet was sighted on the eastern horizon uh, against the rising sun, a forest of masts. 33 French and Spanish battleships and a large number of smaller ships all stretching right across the visible horizon as the British began uh, the attack that Nelson had planned. With the enemy in sight, the ship's bands struck up and played their way into battle. As they got closer to the enemy line, the gun crews would be called to their own guns. They would stand beside the guns, ready to enter into the battle. The British were sailing in, in two parallel columns. Collingwood, the second in command, was at the head of one column on the right. The other column on the left started off with the victory at the head of it. Now, some of Nelson's officers, such as Blackwood and Hardy, they were unhappy about Nelson risking his life at the head of the column like this. Blackwood said to Nelson, come on board Euralis, that was his frigate, and you can control the battle, I'll do all the signals, you can control the battle, you don't need to be on board Victory. Nelson didn't need to do that because he'd already told his captains what he wanted them to do. What he needed to do was lead by example, so the Victory was right there up in the front of the line. During the long, tense approach to battle, the ships were cleared for action, guns run out, and sawdust scattered on the decks to soak up the blood. And Nelson, it's quite clear, got very tense indeed. One of the main reasons for that was that the French and Spanish, instead of trying to escape as he had expected them to, actually stood and awaited his attack. And he was heard to say, they put a very brave face on it, but by God, I'll give them such a drubbing as they'll remember. So he's nerving himself up. As they closed on the enemy, Nelson sought to calm the nerves of the ship's crew. During the long approach to battle, there was time for men to look at what was likely to happen and begin to get that sinking feeling in the pit of the stomach. And so Nelson knew that and looked for ways to keep his men occupied. He actually toured the decks of the victory, uh, speaking to the men at the guns. So he was deliberately raising their morale but he also wanted to communicate to the whole fleet and that's why he decided to send the famous signal England expects that every man will do his duty. He was the perfect naval commander. Uh, he was fearless, physically fearless. Whatever ship he commanded he had the love of his crew and the total devotion and loyalty of his crew. He knew how to make himself love and he had the common touch. As the two fleets closed for action, many sailors and officers scribbled wills and farewell letters. 
Nelson too was thinking of his loved ones, naively entrusting his mistress and illegitimate daughter to the nation. I leave Emma, Lady Hamilton, a legacy to my king and country. I also leave to the beneficence of my country my adopted daughter, Horatia. He said, look after Emma, look after Horatia. But sadly they didn't. The nation didn't. He also seems to have behaved as if this might have been his last moment. He famously said to Captain Blackwood on the quarterdeck of the victory as the first shots were flying overhead, God bless you, Blackwood, I will never speak to you again. Nelson took a huge risk at Trafalgar. By sailing straight out the French and Spanish fleet, he exposed the weakest parts of his ships, the bows, to the concentrated gunfire of the French and Spanish battleships. were light, so the approach took half an hour. So this great ship, the Victory, for example, suffered very badly. Lots of casualties, lost uh, part of her mizzen mast, the aftermast, uh, and very severe damage elsewhere as well. Nelson took risks. The victory would be the first ship of that line to cut the enemy uh, fleet, even though it meant withering fire that they couldn't return. Leading the starboard column, Collingwood's flagship, the Royal Sovereign, cut the Franco-Spanish rear, 15 ships from its end, raking the Santa Ana as she passed astern of her. It was 15 minutes before the rest of Collingwood's ships could come to his aid. As the victory approached the enemy line, Nelson was looking for Admiral Villeneuve's flagship, the Bousson Tour. When they spotted her, Nelson ordered the victory to steer right at her. Nelson wanted to deliver a knockout blow to the enemy commander-in-chief right at the beginning of the battle. And at the last minute, the victory did a sidestep and punched her way through a stern of the Bucentaur. And the broadside from these 50 guns uh, absolutely shattered the stern of the French flagship and almost knocked her out with one broadside. British ship after the victory went astern of her so that the Bucentaur eventually uh, was so badly damaged that Villeneuve had to surrender his ship quite early on in the battle, thus losing all control of the battle, creating the confusion and the pell-mell battle that Nelson wanted. Having attacked the Bucentaur and driven her way, forced her way through a very tightly packed French line, the victory actually got tangled with the French ship Redoutard. Now the captain of the Redoutard, Captain Lucas, realised that he was not going to beat the British in a conventional battle with the great cannons. He was going to fight a musketry battle and a boarding battle. He was going to station extra men up in the tops and the rigging to fire down in the ship and fire as much musketry as he could in the ship. When the battle reached its peak, the quarter deck and the poop of the victory were being swept with shot from all directions. There was a vast amount of lead and iron flying about in these decks. And what is going on is Bedlam. They're exposed to cannonballs, musket balls, wood splinters, wood splinters in all directions, blocks of tackle, ropes cut. We know that Captain Lucas on the Redoubtable threw over 200 grenades onto the top of victory. Nelson and Hardy were pacing up and down on the quarter deck. Uh, just in front of the victory's wheel. 
shot had already passed between Hardy and Nelson and had ripped the buckle off off uh, Hardy's shoe and bruised his foot. And Nelson said, this is too warm work to last long, Hardy. And they went on walking up and down again. At one point, Hardy went a little further in the walk to look down the hatchway that leads down into the lower gun decks. And when he turned, Nelson was already beginning to fall. The musket ball penetrated through his gold epaulette, taking a little bit of the, the gold with it. It went down through his lungs and it hit his spine. His lungs were filling up with blood. He was paralysed from, from the, the waist down. He immediately falls forward and he attempts to uh, support himself on his left arm. Uh, and his left arm gave way and he fell onto the deck. Hardy rushed up to him and he heard him say, I believe they've done it at last. Hardy says, I hope not. And Nelson says, my backbone is shot through. As he was carried down below, uh, great presence of mind, he took out a handkerchief and covered his face and the stars on his chest so that his men wouldn't see him and be uh, disturbed by the fact that their admiral had been shot. The cockpit must have looked like a butcher's shambles. BT, the surgeon, and his assistants were trying to come to terms with 40 men who were either dead on arrival, dying. He is in an, in, an inordinate amount of, of, of pain. Um, he actually says that he wishes he was dead, and then he thinks of Lady Hamilton, and he says one would like to live a little longer. As he talks, as he tries to make himself understood, he is coughing up blood. Beatty says to him, what are your symptoms? He says, I feel every instant a gush of blood within my breast. So it is the most appalling death because he suffocates in his own blood uh, and um, he knows it. Nelson actually survived his wound for three and a half hours, during which time he was in severe agony, but at least that meant that he lived long enough to learn that the battle had been won. First of all, they told him 12 or 13 ships, and he gasped, I bargained for 20, and then Hardy came and told him the news that there were at least 14 or 15. So by the time he actually died, he knew that this incredible, decisive victory that he had planned for uh, had actually been won. Dr. Beatty, the surgeon of HMS Victory, wrote a very moving account of the death of Nelson in which he records nearly all of Nelson's words. And some of it rings awfully true. Um, Nelson saying, um, for instance, fan, fan, fan. He wanted them to fan him to give him, this was terribly hot down in the all up. And drink, 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 give him some water. And rub, 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 because the only thing that could soothe him was uh, uh, rubbing here. And of course, most movingly, uh, right at the end, just before he died, he asked Hardy, Thomas Hardy, captain of the Victory, to kiss him. It shows that right at the moment of death, that need for assurance, that need for affection that uh, he had had ever since his childhood. Uh, and so I find the famous kiss uh, a very moving and poignant part of the Nelson story. At about 4.30, the last shots were fired and the end of the battle was marked with a shattering explosion as the French battleship La Chille blew up. When the news of Trafalgar finally reached England in November, it was a mixture of euphoria over the news that Napoleon's fleet had been destroyed and the invasion of England had also disappeared but also then the great grief that Nelson had been lost. An admiralty official came in and said to Emma, we have won a great victory. And she said, never mind your victory, what about Lord Nelson? And then she knew. We had said to Hardy during his dying hours, you won't throw me overboard, will you? Well, there was never any prospect of that, of course. Nelson was put in a cask of brandy and taken home, and he lay in state in Greenwich Hospital for several days. The story goes 
that Nelson had once been told that Westminster Abbey was built on sand and likely to subside in a few centuries. And so, before he died, it said he made it clear that he wanted to be buried in St. Paul's Cathedral. The funeral itself was the biggest thing that London had ever seen. There were 10,000 troops lining the route. The procession was so long that the head of the procession had reached St. Paul's before the rear of the procession had left Whitehall. Six black-plumed horses drew a funeral car shaped like the victory. Its figurehead, the goddess of fame. The coffin was the one ordered by Nelson before he set out for Trafalgar. There was a noise like a murmuring of the sea which was recorded by a witness as the men took their hats off in respect as the coffin passed. The service in St Paul's was an occasion for national grief like few before or since. They mourned the hero who had died saving his country. But they also mourned the man they'd come to love, who was as flawed and as human as they were themselves. <laughs>